so delighted to have Justin Yates back home. He grew up in this church. His parents are Diane and, and Mike Yates. Uh, and after he went away from college, he spent eight years working uh, at colleges and universities in Ohio, New York, Virginia, and Florida before he felt a call to the ministry. He now serves as a missionary with the middle and high school students uh, in Orlando, Florida, through an organization called now called Crew. When I was uh, living on campus, it was Campus Crusade for Christ. Justin and his wife Stacy live in Orlando, Florida. I'm sorry Stacy couldn't be here. I've met her once. Uh, I wish you all could have a chance to meet her as well. But Stacy and Justin are getting ready to celebrate their first anniversary. So would you welcome, please, Justin Yates to, to preach this morning's Word of God. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Ah, good. Just like the first service, I didn't have to ask you again. That's so nice. Um, well, I feel like I need to mention there's one thing that I will warn you about this morning. I don't think I will be as entertaining as the children's time. And so <laughs> I'm really sorry about that, but hopefully you can bear with me. Uh, <laughs> no. But as, as uh, Pastor Dorothy said, it really is a pleasure for me to be here this morning. Um, as she mentioned, I grew up here at Highland. Um, when I was in high school and a youth, um, I actually came to the, know the Lord um, while a member here. And so for me, it's really kind of a neat homecoming. And I also want to extend a quick welcome to um, those of you who don't usually worship here with us at Highland, but you've made the journey, some of you from Northern Virginia, from the East Coast, from elsewhere in the area, um, to come. And so thank you for coming here today. Um, I love this church family, um, and I'm really thankful that Pastor Dorothy has allowed for me to give the message this morning. Um, however, time will tell if that was actually a smart decision on her part. Uh, so, as we go in, um, for me, one of the greatest mysteries of our faith is understanding who God is. When you really stop to think about it, God can almost seem like he has a personality disorder. He's three distinct persons, and yet also one. And when you look at the Old Testament, it's filled with references to this vengeful, powerful, and destructive God. Stories of floods, pillars of fire, plagues, and miraculous signs feel like they're on every page. Just consider some of his names, even. The Great I Am, the Lord Our Righteousness, Our Strong Tower, the Sword and Shield. He sounds like a pretty aggressive and powerful God. And then there comes another side, and thank God for that other side, the Sacrificial Lamb, the Prince of Peace, and the Servant. And it's the Servant that we're going to focus on this morning. Each of us knows someone who has a servant's heart. As I say the word servant, each of us is probably thinking of someone we know who we would classify as a servant. We all have that friend, coworker, spouse, or parent whose greatest joy and purpose comes from serving and caring for others. And while their accomplishments are great and their home-cooked meals are very much appreciated, especially in the Yates household, they cannot compare to the service of our Savior Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself called his disciples to serve. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we know that Jesus has called us, both me and you, to serve. But what does that actually look like? What are the characteristics of a Christian servant? The Apostle Paul gives us the answer to this in his letter to the Philippians. If you would, you can turn in your pew Bible, or I think we're actually going to have it up here on the screen. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Perfect. If you have any encouragement being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, and if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, 
but to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of the servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death so before we go too much further, I want to pause and just reflect on Paul's language and imagery here. This is truly probably one of my favorite passages in the entire New Testament because it so beautifully captures the essence of Christ and that of servanthood. And so there's a lot of good stuff in this passage, but I'm going to try and pick out just key attributes just for the sake of time. Humbleness is the first, or humility. Humility was not a virtue in Paul's day. Status within the Jewish community was something that was cultivated through generations and meticulously maintained. Fast forward 2,000 years, and humility isn't that much more valuable these days. Uh, this is partially to do, I think, with our emphasis on self-importance. Uh, humility is something that is hard to achieve in the age of selfies and selfie sticks. But there you go, thank you, good job. All right, being humble means checking your motives and selfish desires at the door. I was reading a story the other day about another man in ministry, probably around the same age as I am, and he felt like God was calling him to serve the homeless and people struggling with addiction, but yet he felt no burden whatsoever to help those people. And so he shared his story with a wise and seasoned missionary who encouraged him to spend time serving and loving these people, even though he didn't really want to. And after a year, this reluctant missionary was transformed. There was no one else on his team who loved and cared for these needy people. Rather than fighting with God and telling him that he knew his own heart better, the young missionary set aside his own desires to see what God had in store for him. Jesus emptied himself when he was born a man. He did this, he did this to become finite, limited, and vulnerable just like you and me. And in so doing, he was able to experience all of the pains and sufferings that human existence has to offer, despite the fact that he was God. Through the example of Christ, we are called to a servant's life. The life of a servant is not glamorous. Rather, it is a life of submission, which is not to be confused with my mindlessness or fear. I don't know why I messed that one up. Uh, it is a conscious and god honor perspective. Humility is not just a self-sacrificing attitude. It puts us in a place where we are open to being obedient, and that's where we're going to go next. Servants are required to be obedient. In this passage to the Philippians, Paul uses some great language to describe the obedience of Christ. In verse 8, Paul says, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death. This little verse holds a pretty powerful message within it. In the ancient world, death by crucifixion was a very degrading death. It was a painful, cruel, and slow death that transpired in the full view of the public. In fact, that was part of the point. The shame and misery that accompanied it were well known, and crucifixion was very effective at keeping criminals and those who rebelled against the authority of Rome in a place of fear. And Jesus would have surely known what this death would have looked like, and he knew what was to come into his final days. In the book of Matthew, the mother of James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, asked Christ if her sons may sit at his right and at his left in heaven. In response, Jesus asked the brothers if they were willing to drink from the same cup that he was to drink from. Now, he didn't mean his Nalgene bottle or a glass of wine. He was asking the brothers if they were willing to put down their own vanity and ambition and suffer the same bitterness that awaited Christ at the cross. Paul makes it clear and reminds us that Christ is fully man. If he was human, that means Jesus also had free will. Jesus chose to go to death on the cross. He chose to be obedient, knowing what was waiting for him. And obedience is not easy. Humans have a natural desire to rebel against God, our parents, me, yesterday with speed limits, and so on. I might appear to be the child of, oh gosh, what am I talking about? 
Uh, I might appear to be the poster child of obedience, being the missionary and all, but I assure you, appearances can be deceiving. Nearly four years ago, I actually had my first experience with a call to ministry. At the time, I was working at Lynchburg College, and I was preparing to work on my doctorate. I had my whole life figured out. I was going to get my doctorate before I was 30, I was going to get married, and I'd live in Virginia forever. The end. Needless to say, my plan and God's plan were not the same. The day that I was supposed to start my classes, in walked a campus chaplain, and then another one, and then another one. In the span of a few hours, three chaplains visited me, we chatted for a little bit, and then each ended our conversation with the same question. Have you ever thought about going to seminary or doing full-time ministry? At first I laughed, and I thought, well, that was weird. And then, and there's always the then with God, God started working on my heart to cultivate a heart for ministry. I began to think about how the material in my classes applied to the church and ministering to young people. And I considered going the pastor route and going to seminary, but that didn't quite seem like the right fit for me. And so with a lack of clear direction, I packed up and moved to Florida to work at another university. It took me about three years and a move of about a thousand miles before God finally made it clear that he was preparing me to serve as a missionary to middle school and high school students. And to be honest, I still live in a place where I'm not really sure exactly how God intends me to use in all this. But if there's one thing that I've learned in studying the Bible lately, it's this. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Again, he doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. God does this so that he can receive all the glory for the deeds and works that people do in his name and through his power and not our own. Obedience doesn't make us mindless. Rather, an obedient heart draws us closer to God's will and purpose, making us stronger in his spirit and in his love. Lastly, I want to talk about verses 3 through 4. Paul says to consider others better than yourselves and that each of us should look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Looking after each other's interests can come in a lot of different forms. From what I understand here at Highland, you guys have started serving uh, Wednesday night dinner to those in need. That's meeting people's earthly needs. Stopping by to sing Christmas carols to shut-ins, or bringing a warm meal to an elderly couple. That's meeting people's needs. Or, as is constantly the case with my phase of life um, with Stacy, we like to go and help babysit for young couples so that they can then go have a date night. That's meeting people's earthly needs. For those of you who haven't heard me talk about ministry before, you've probably heard me reference a boy named Pedro. Uh, Pedro just graduated from high school and he was a lineman on the football team. Uh, I like to think of uh, Pedro, he's about 6'2", 6'3", probably weighs somewhere between 250 and 280 pounds. Uh, if I was on the football field with him, I'd be like a cartoon where I'd just run into him. The end. And Pedro, what's unique about him is he's still a baby Christian. He just accepted Christ this past February, and so his walk is still kind of a walk in progress. One of my favorite stories about Pedro actually just came a few weeks ago before he graduated from high school. One day, Pedro was sitting in class getting ready to open up his bag of chips for his post-lunch snack when you're a football player, you have to have a post-lunch snack. And as he was getting ready to devour his chips, he noticed a kid sitting across from him who was looking longingly at his bag of chips. And the other boy said something about being hungry and asked him if he could have a few. Pedro tells the story that in this moment, he really felt like he heard God tell him to give the boy his chips. And Pedro said, but God, you know that I love my chips. To which God responded, I know. But if you love me, you should love him. Give him your chips. And so Pedro looked at the boy and thought, what if this kid hasn't had anything to eat today? What if this is the only thing that he'll eat today? And so he willingly conceded to God and gave the now delighted boy his chips. And I share this story partially to get you in the mindset of a high school boy, but also to remind you that as followers of Christ, we need to be mindful of the needs of others. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that many of us in this room, myself and Pedro included, struggle with selfishness. As a newlywed, 
I can assure you that despite my most sincere efforts, I struggle with selfishness every single day. My wife reminds me of that. And at, and at the center of caring for others is one concept, and that's love. If you do not love someone, your desire to help and care for that person is much diminished. Thankfully, though, we have a model to follow in Jesus. For he loved us so much that he died while we still sinned against him and still do to this day. We should be compelled by Christ's example to love and care for others well. And not just our family, our friends, and our Sunday school classes, but the beggar that's on the side of the road, the teen who struggles with their sexuality, the single mother who's in the process of getting a divorce, people who are in our congregations, our churches, and our communities that are experiencing real, genuine brokenness. I wonder what our lives would look like, what the church would look like, if we were more focused on the needs of others, if we loved others more than ourselves. And I have a hint of what that might look like. We would constantly be on a mission, on a mission to serve and love others well through the love of Christ. And that's where I'm going to end today. We're called by Christ to live in the shadow of his example, to be obedient, to be humble, and to look out for the interests of others. But there's one important thing to keep in mind. Even if we do all of these things, we will never be equal to Jesus. Our works are insignificant before the works of Christ. And if the standard of a Christian life is to be obedient to death on a cross and perfectly humble like Jesus, I know I can't do it, and I would assume most of us cannot. None of us can meet that standard. I don't share this with you to drain you of hope, but rather to fill you with hope and joy that can be found in Christ. These passages point us not to a works-based approach to our faith, but to a need for Jesus and for the beautiful sacrifice that he offered. And there's nothing that we can do to earn this gift, but we can accept it, and we can open it, accept it openly and embrace the life that's directed through Christ and his spirit. Because of what Jesus did for us, we can honor him, though, by serving. For it's written, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is not only experienced, but it is lived out, both within and outside the walls of the church. As Christians, we can share our faith in two different ways, through proclamation and through demonstration. People have to see the difference in our lives and hear why we are different. That's when they are most inclined to believe. And this allows their faith to be grounded in God's grace and not just their actions or ours. And I'm not saying that each of us should go stand on a street corner with signs and pamphlets about Jesus. Each of us has certain skills and gifts that make each of us uniquely capable of serving and demonstrating God's love in our own way. And while each of us is still uniquely formed and made, we have a collective and common calling through the unity of our faith. And that calling is to share the love of Christ with others. And what better way is there to love and serve a person than to share the everlasting love of our Savior with them to give them eternal life. And as I close us in a time of prayer, I hope that you would pray and allow Christ to continue to mold and make each of us more and more into his servant. And we might that we might also have a greater understanding of the difference his sacrifice has made in our earthly and eternal lives. And lastly, I would ask that you think of someone you know who does not know the Lord, that you would like to ask God to provide that person with an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship in your church. We thank you for who you are and for the sacrifice of your Son, that you might forgive our sins and give us eternal life. May we be made more and more your servant each day, and to be obedient to where your spirit is leading us. We pray for our friends, our family, and our co-workers who do not know you or your love. 
We pray that you might provide divine appointments and opportunities for them to see you and to know who you are. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. All right. So I'm going to take a few minutes with you because I realize I've dropped some heavy stuff on you. So now we're going to have a fun time for the next few minutes. And then I actually have to run down to the compass service. So I'm going to say bye to you in a second. But what I wanted to do is Highland is one of our partners in ministry. You all as a church community allow for me to do the ministry that's happening in Orlando. And so I wanted to come and share with you some stories about what's happened over the past year. And so my tech friend will maybe move us into the next slide. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. All right, we'll move on. Um, two of my students that I've worked with this past year um, have very different faith walks. One of them, her name is Kaya. Kaya is a senior. She just graduated. She's going to be going to college here in the fall. And Kaya kind of reminds me of myself in that when I was younger, my concept of my faith was based on perfection. I felt like I had to be the perfect person. I had to work very hard. I had to be a good student. And there's so much more to our faith than that. And Kaya, um, throughout this year, God really used opportunities to get her out of that mindset. Kaya is that student who wants to be the next future president, senator, CEO of a Fortune 500 company before she's 25. That's her life ambition. And she really had a desire to go to Princeton, Harvard, these beautiful, dramatic, influential schools. And don't worry, she's going to Notre Dame, so it's you know, second best. Or, you know, hopefully no Notre Dame grads in here. Um, and so, with her, what's similar to, to the two of us is this year we were teaching uh, out of Romans 8. And there's a passage in there where Paul is talking about salvation. And he says, I'm certain that there is nothing, no heavens, no demons, no heights, no depths, mountains, valleys, rivers, that can separate a believer from the love of Christ. And when we share that passage, Kaya goes, so wait a minute. I thought that every time that I sinned, if I didn't ask for forgiveness, that meant that I was going to hell. It's like, no, oh, there's so much more grace that God has to offer than that. And what was really interesting, Kaya grew up in the church, and so she's had this mindset for years. And so we asked, do any of you in the room think the same thing? Did you have the same idea? Ten more hands went up. And What's beautiful about our ministry is sometimes, yes, we work with kids that have no faith background, but sometimes we also have the opportunity to release these kids from faulty theology that's really held them captive for years. Because that's why Kaya and her friends wouldn't tell others about who Jesus was, because it wasn't a freeing experience. It wasn't good news. It was work. And so once she had that moment, you could just see the weight be lifted off of her shoulders. And the last student that I want to tell you about is Cameron. If you've ever heard me talk about our ministry before, you've probably heard me talk about a boy who I asked for him to define love, and he couldn't do it. Cameron is part of um, a family of divorce. Both of his parents are divorced. And neither one of them really seemed to have an interest in him. Um, he lives with his father, but that's more out of necessity than want. And his father kicks him out of the house, usually at least once a week, um, just for being a teenager like all of us once were, probably mouthing off or something. But his father would completely kick him out of the house, and he would have to stay with a friend. Or the week before I talked to him, he actually slept on a park bench one night the week before we met. And so when I asked him to define love, he was like, well, I can't. I've never seen it or experienced it. And so I can't define that. And that just broke my heart thinking about that. And so he's been coming to crew for the last year. And in the spring, my wife and I went to a church that had invited youth to he came with us. And at that, there was an evangelist who shared, and then they did an altar call at the end. And he went up front, and we prayed with him, both my wife and I. And afterwards, a few days later, we asked him, we're like, so what, what did you go up there for? What did you feel? And he said, well, I felt that, um, that I needed God, but he didn't accept Christ at that point. And so I share that story with you because there's still work to be done. There's so many more kids like Cameron that are not only on that campus, 
but on the 34 middle school campuses and the 19 high school campuses that are in Orlando. There's a huge need there. And so while I thank Highland so much for your support, both as a church and the individuals and families that are here, I also come to share because I'm still preparing to go into my full-time ministry assignment. And while I'm here in town, I'm meeting with people to share about our ministry, to encourage people to pray for our ministry, but also to consider supporting us so that we can do this full time. And so if you feel led, if you feel like this is a ministry that you would want to partner with beyond just simply a church, but you as a family would like to support us, I have information up on the front row. You can sign up, you can receive ministry updates from us, and I have cards and contact information. I'm only in town for a few more days, and so if you'd like to meet with me, um, please reach out to me and let me know, because I'd love to meet with you and share a little bit more. And so with that, I am now going to go down to the compass service, but I will be back, so if you'd like to talk to me more, I'll be here at the end of the service. Thank you guys for having me.